This is Larry Hedrick for Mysteries of Superstition Mountains, where we bring the past into the present for our future viewers. Today we have another great story by Jack San Felice. Hello folks, we've got a great story for you today. It's a very difficult story to write, but nevertheless it's a great story. It's based on three major newspaper articles written by a guy by the name of, no less, Pierpont Constable Big Nell, who was from New York. Now, what brings Pierpont Constable Big Nell to Arizona to become one of the most famous writers of the Lotz Dutchman legend in the 1870s? here before it was a legend. He was one of the most interesting characters to ever come to Arizona. He was called Pierpont Constable Bicknell, PC Bicknell, but for the most part, he liked to be referred to as simply Bick, B-I-C-K. And that is the way he authored most of his articles, Bick. And everybody knew who Bicknell was. He brings you through the legend. The three main articles that he wrote, two of them were found by most writers. The first one was found, he wrote the last. The next one that he wrote was actually the first he wrote. And the third article that is part of this legend was not found until 2016. So that makes it really complicated to put this in a vernacular. We all understand it. So what I'm going to do is actually read these excerpts from them in hope that we get a better understanding of what Bicknell was saying and what he found. Well, Bicknell was educated in the East, in New York, and he went to some of the most famous writing schools there to be a journalist. He developed a disease that we sometimes know as consumption, but it was also called tuberculosis. So it was a form of tuberculosis that he developed. So he thought it would be better for him to come west. And west he did in the 1870s. Now, if you realize that the Dutchman story in the 1870s was merely a rumor, merely rumors. It was not really become a written story until, in fact, he started writing articles about Jacob Waltz. And on we go. Well, so Big Nell comes out here and he starts searching. He, not only is he um, interested in uh, being a journalist and writing, and he wrote for several of the major, major newspapers of, this, of that era. And that included the Phoenix uh, Daily Press. It included the Phoenix Gazette and the uh, and the Phoenix uh, Republican, as well as the Mesa Free Press. Also, to those two major articles, two of them got in the San Francisco Chronicle. And one of them, the, one of the, I believe the most important one he wrote, which was the second, came out in uh, 1894, in November, or, yeah, November, and I believe, and then the last article, it was also published in a Kansas newspaper, which was then redistributed throughout the United States. And most people only saw the 1895 article, January 13th. But that was reprinted in the San Francisco Chronicle again. So that makes for the confusion. And if you're doing serious research on the lost Dutchman, it's really confusing. So this is, this is why this makes this talk so important to the history and the legend of the lost Dutchman in mind. You have to play close attention now. Bick is, is now in Phoenix and he's living in Phoenix and he's at how about everybody knows each other back then in Phoenix in the 1870s. It's a small town, mud huts for the most part. It wasn't the Phoenix that you would know today or even of the early 1900s, it was just totally different. So as, as we go along on this story, you'll see that he wrote, in addition to these three, 
three more very, very important newspaper articles that affect the legend of the lost Dutchman mine. And one of these is about, was written in 1881. And it's about Bicknell, and it says, Bicknell has gone in with another man into the Superstition Mountains for a month. Bicknell was no armchair uh, historian, no armchair miner. He was gone for a month into the mountains. It, it meant that he was following the stories now in 1881 of the lost Dutchman legend because the Dutchman died in 1891, October 25th. Prior to that, he, he wrote a story called Foul Murder, and this was 1884. Foul Murder of a Suspected Friend. The story is that in 1884, at Jacob Waltz's house, two of Jacob Waltz's Mexican friends were there, and one of them picks up a shotgun and shoots and kills the other, forever to disappear from the annals of journalism. He just, we don't know what the shooting was about. It was investigated, and they believed the story by Jacob Waltz of two Mexicans and one shooting the other. The gun's still there. Jacob Waltz is there. One man's there, and the other one's gone. So he is charged with the murder, but never found. So in 1881 and 1883, Bicknell's out there because the rumor is out that Jacob Waltz is handing out money, and money in the form of gold. And he's handing out money to his friend, Julia Thomas. And he's paying for things with gold. He's been to the Silver King mine where he stopped to make purchases. He's been to Florence where he is known to make purchases and pay for it in gold dust or gold nuggets. So, the three most important stories are, number one, it, it's a curious find, a two-room house in a cave. The second one is a called a mythical mine, and um, it takes place in 1894, three years after Jacob Waltz had died. And then the third one is called Arizona's Lost uh, El Dorado, which came out in January 13th of 1895. So all three of these very important articles, one which was lost to me until uh, 2016 in my book, my book that I wrote on Lost El Dorado was, not, was written in 2016 before I even saw that article. So that's not in here. This is new information. The origins of the Dutchman clues come from these three newspaper articles. He was the most important, I believe, journalist of his time regarding Jacob Waltz, forever known as the Lost Dutchman. And these three stories, and I'm going to put them, I'm going to give them to you, and I'm going to read from some of them. Like I said, I want you to get the flavor of it. Not only that, be able to go back. Mrs. E.W. Thomas, formerly of the Thomas Ice Cream Parlors, is now in the Superstition Mountains, engaged in a work usually deemed strange to a woman's sphere. She is prospecting for a lost mine, the location of which she, she holds the key. But somehow she has failed. After two months' work to locate the Bonanza, through aided by two men. That would be Riney and Herman Patrash. And a third, the father, who only went out for a while. The story of the mine is founded on the actual deathbed revelation of an ancient miner, usually in such cases. There is also a lost cabin connected with it. Its location is supposed to be a short distance back from the western end of the main superstitions, supposed to be. Bicknell, as I said before, was one of the most important writers, and he wrote most of the stories on the Lost Dutchman Mine, but he was never quoted in the early books. 
Why? Because no computers. Uh, they didn't have access to microfilm. They had to go through the voluminous stacks of the old papers, which weren't kept and they weren't codified then. So that, that's part of the problem. But regardless of the problem, he, I believe, was the most important writer. This was the first story he wrote on November 9th. And, and what he had done was he'd hiked out to some cliff dwellings. He was also, he also was a great believer in archaeology, archaeological expeditions and looking and studying archaeology, as well as writing about the mining and current events in the mining activities all around the Phoenix area. So he writes this and he, and he says, pioneers of Arizona, curious homes of the first family. A cliff dwelling found in an inaccessible canyon, superb masonry. They got the cliff dwelling in Angel Springs. And why is this important? You'll see. Yet in this neighborhood, Bicknell declares that the Thorn Mine was found three decades ago. That's the story of Doc Thorn. The cliff dwellings, well answering the descriptions of the stone cabin in which the doctor had his adobe. The cliff dwelling in Rogers Canyon is about 15 miles north of Weaver's Needle. And that is, that again is a very important clue, the 15 miles. Jesse Feldman in his book, Jacob's Trail, published a photo of himself and his brother Josh in Rogers Canyon Cliff Dwelling beside the center post with Bick Nell's name carved in it during 2007. Oh, wait a minute. This article wasn't available to Jesse and Josh then. They had no idea. They find Bick Nell's name. Bick Nell, 1897 on the center post of the Cliff Dwelling. Okay? Steve Bowser... Uh, during 2011, another uh, long hiker into the Superstition uh, Mountains, along with his niece, April Scott, also located and took photos of the Big Nell's name carved in the center post at my request. Because I had Jesse's stories, so I want to confirm it. Then I said, well, I'm going back to the old master, Jack Carlson. Because he's hiked that, he's been to the cliff dwellings many times. I said, Jack, could you go through their files, uh, photograph, see if you could find a photo that you took on a center post with Bicknell's name in it. And sure enough, he was there in 1999 on one occasion, and he took photos of the center post in his files, and it's got Bicknell, 1894. So this confirms that he was there, in, I believe, in 1894. It's the same writing all three times. The cliff dwelling at Angel Springs, which was in fact only two miles from mines where gold was found in the 1870s in the Superstition Mountains near Rogers Canyon and Rogers Ridge. So the finding of this two-room house in a cave, which was essential to the Dutchman's story, one of the key clues you had to find the two-room house in the cave in order to go further and look for the other clues. The next story deals with a newspaper article called A Mythical Mine. December 30th of 1894, December 30th. And it directs people searching for the Dutchman mine to the northeast, the northeast section of the Superstition Mountains, where the two-room house in the cave was. Mythical Mine, December 30th, 1894, by Beck. In a gulch in the Superstition Mountains, the location of which is described by certain landmarks, there is a two-room house in the mouth of a cave on the side of a slope near the gulch some distance above the tunnel on the side of the mountain is a shaft or incline that is not so steep, but one can climb down. This too is 
covered carefully with brush. The shaft goes right down on the midst of a rich gold ledge where it can be picked off <clears throat> in big flakes of pure gold. After Dutch Jacob had been buried, the woman took off with a miner with her to actually know there was more than one miner and spent the entire summer looking for the mine, but she was unable to find the mine because she had been searching near Weaver's Needle. That's my statement. The two-room house is one of the key clues in the search for the Dutchman. For years, no one could locate this critical clue or claim to have located it. McNeil himself was at the two-room house in a cave, com commonly referred on treasure maps of the Lost Dutchman Mine as Caverna Concasa, and the so-called, quote, Ruth map had it on it, which was published by Barry Storm and a whole host of everybody, including myself. And it says, Caverna Concasa, which means house in a cave. And that was the key clue. But it was only about two miles away from these mines where gold was found. And one particular mine, a lot of gold, high-grade gold. Okay. So we have those two stories. Now, let's get to what really confused everybody. <clears throat> what really confused everybody was this 1895 article called One of Arizona's Lost El Dorados, which, by the way, was the title for my book, Lost El Dorado of Jacob Walt. And that's where I took the story from. And this was the first newspaper article that I had on the du major article on the Dutchman Mine was this one, but it was written January 13th, 1895. Articles remained hidden from me. I believe one on purpose, so people could search for the mine near Weaver's Needle. And let me get to this. Let me read this. The first part of it tells you one thing, and then the second part of this story tells you another. And it takes you back to Weaver's Needle. But it's very confusing. And this is the article that I lived by for a long time. One of Arizona's lost El Dorados, a mine in the Superstition Mountains, that there exists, that there exists, an undiscovered gold mine of fabulous wealth near a point in the Superstition Mountains, not more than 50 miles from Phoenix, has long been an article of faith among a number of mining men uh, in a promise, in a position rather, to sift the mass of evidence accumulated during the past 20 years. This, he's writing in January 13th of 1895, less than a month that he wrote the first article. Okay. The facts and unrelated statements although re emanating from widely diverse sources and furnished by persons who could have had no possible connection with each other. In other words, all prospectors and miners and searchers for the Lost Dutchman Mine could have had no possible connection with each other. All agree in a remarkable manner to the description of the mine. And what is still more convincing are unanimous in indicating a particular quarter of the mountains in question as the place of its location. Now, here, here is another clue to the mine. It talks about, Bix uncovers this clue, and it's called the First Gorge. And that contributes to the confusion in his interview with Julia Thomas. He'd interviewed her many times. Okay. The first gorge on the south side from the west end of the range, they found, as he had told them, was a monumented trail which had them northward over a lofty ridge, downward past Sombrero Butte, into a long canyon running north and finally, to a tributary canyon, very deep and rocky and densely wooded, 
with a continuous thicket of scrub oak. And that is a, a very important clue for you to read. The district de designated is not extensive. It lies within an imaginary circle whose diameter is not more than five miles and whose center is marked by Weaver's Needle. Now, wait a minute. Five miles is not going to get you to Rogers Ridge and the Stone House. But here lies, I believe, a resolution to that. The Dutchman spoke, when he was speaking to, to Reine and um, Julia, he was speaking in German, because they both spoke German fluently. They all three were from Germany. So he says, Old Jake did not call Weaver's Needle by name. He always referred to it as the pointed rock, as the needle, not Weaver's Needle. Note, Walt spoke in German to Julia and Reine, and the German word for five is spelled F-U-N-Z. And the word for 15 starts with F-U-N-Z. Here lies, I believe, the answer to this five versus 15 miles. Could they have mistaken the Waltz's word five for 15? Of course they could have. They weren't paying attention. In fact, most of the books on it you'll read. This is how confused so many people and the rest of the article, if you understand it, cite the clues as where it could be. Bicknell also write, here the woman is at fault. That's Julia. She has forgotten whether the canyon enters from the west or east. These two bits of information have misled many searchers over the years. Bick writes here about Weaver's Needle area. But based on the following information, these clues simply do not fit the Weaver's Needle area. The Weaver's Needle location places the, the actual gold mine, I believe 12 miles from Weaver's Needle at Rogers Ridge, and specifically narrows the search they did of most of those hunters. And most of the people died in the shootouts and all of the stuff, even up into the and died mysteriously, uh, not so mysteriously, even in the, 18, the 1990s, and even late and beyond, and search for gold at Weaver's Needle, which not, simply does not exist. It's very difficult for me to find these articles and put them in, in, in order, as like I say. Now, Bicknell writes in his clues in the second article, and he puts everybody up in the Rogers Ridge area and Rogers, the Rogers Trough designated trail going to the cliff dwelling. And the cliff dwelling's two miles from the mines on Rogers Ridge. They're not within the five mile circle, but remember the word F-U-N-Z, five, the start of the 15 is F-U-N-Z, they didn't get it right. They weren't paying attention. The Dutchman was right. And he gave Reine Hill all the time. You must pay attention to me, he said in German. That mine is hard to find. And it was for me as well as everybody. This is one of the real mysteries of the mountains. Did Bick take gold from the pit mine and wanted people to stay away from it because hunters of the Lost Dutchman line, like myself and several others. And Jesse Feldman is one of them. And Jesse's father, Ron, we all believe that it's up in the northeast section of the Superstition Mountain. And if you read these articles correctly, so did McNeil. The, the story on the, did the editor change it? When he put this story out, did the editor change it and write 15 instead of five? We'll never know. We'll never know. Bicknell has already moved when that, he had already moved when the story was actually printed, as it turns out. I'm now done with those three articles, but they are the substance of the Lost Dutchman Mine legend.
the origin, origins of the lost Dutchman mine. And not only that, but in the third article, in, in January 13, Julia is telling Bick Nell, Bick, the story of the Peraltas and how they came into the mountains, how Jacob Waltz met them in the south, in Mexico, et cetera, et cetera. And that brings all that part of that hocus pocus legend in, into, uh, that the mythical and legendary story right there. The, the continuing of the stories will be my search and going up there a numerous time and going up and finding the cliff dwelling. The cliff dwelling and the clues that led to it, finding the two room house was very important to me because because of that, I was able to find the Horsehead Rock and the Trick in the Trail, which leads you upwards from Rogers Canyon to the pit mine by following a zigzag canyon, because you pass to the old rock cabin and the corral, and then you go up to the mine. The cliff dwelling turned out to be one of the most important clues for me because it gave me a starting point to, I know from the top of the mountain, I see, okay, I know the mines are up there. I was there in um, my last story, I believe, in I called Lost El Dorado. I said I found it because I'm waiting for my friend. He's looking for some mines around this stone heart of the Peralta legend, which I was if very iffy on that. So I found the horse trail and went up. In 2006, I very seriously started searching from that area. So in April of 2006, Jack Carlson and Dick Walt, Bob Stombach and I, we're, going to, we're hiking from Rogers Trough. And it got warm that day, and as it can sometimes get warm or sometimes can get very cold at night. As I stated, I believe in the last talk, we started out at 70 degrees and wound up at 28 degrees before we got out of there. So this is during the day and that's starting at night, but it don't get cold, it gets warmer. So we take a, a break by the water on, we're hiking on in, we're taking our time. Because I'm photographing everything. And Bob Stombach and I, Bob Stombach was a professional photographer. And we're, we're, we're looking for a horse head rock. Because Jesse in his book talks about a, his notes and his book, he's talking about a horse head rock. Okay. One of the clues that, that's been given out by Ted Cox and given up by Julia Thomas, been given out by Big Nell. And the map Julia Thomas has a horse head on it. So the Dutchman talks about a horse head rock. Julia talks about it. Ted Cox talks about it. So we're looking for it. But they don't tell you where exactly it is. It's somewhere up in the mountains. So we start from a logical place, the cliff dwellings. So we've got to find the cliff dwellings and start from there. On our way in, we're taking photographs. We see all kinds of, all kinds of rock formations that could be, could be the horse head, as later goes. Bob Stombuck, unbeknownst to me, he, he takes slide film, as I was taking slide film, and I was having a cassette, and I show it to my classes, this story of that hike up there, and we're coming around a cassette, and the show's all, the, and all of a sudden, up jumps a picture of a rock, and then in front of it, Bob Stombuck and superimposed a real horse head. So the whole class is laughing. They, have, they got a joke on the, the, author, the author and they got the joke on the lecture, right? It was all a good time. So that was a good laugh, but it wasn't the horse head. Because we'd walk there and we didn't find it. But on the way back, this big horse head, that, uh, big rock formation, I said, well, it's got to be a, very notable rock. That's notable, but it didn't look like one. But coming back, we stopped by this big boulder, and I'm taking photographs of that rock formation. And doggone it, it I take one photo, I get a little closer, and it, it looks like it, that could be the horse's head. And from that point, from that point where those boulder, that big boulder was, the trail divides to a Y. If you go left, you go Rogers. 
go right, you go through a bouldery, very bouldered at the beginning, very brush, brushy side canyon, which leads you to uphill of going and this zigzag canyon, which takes you right up to the pit mine, which I always called it. And I, to this day, I call it the pit mine. And that's where it led me to. And before that, you go, you see, as you're going up, you see tall trees. Um, and the tall trees, cottonwood and sycamore, et cetera. But that's where spring was, right next to where the stone cabin was and the stone corral. So now it's all making sense. You have the two-room cabin. You come down. You see the horse head. At that time, you see the horse head, the trail splits, and it was called by John Chuney, who wrote on it, that John Chuney said he found the mine. He found the gold. John Chuney worked for Jim Bark, and he'd actually found gold and set up a rasters in the old Salt River bed and took gold from some of the mines they found there. But it wasn't the mine that Chuney was looking for. Because Chuney was at the Silver King mine when the two soldiers came in. And so he thought the two soldiers mine and the Dutchman mine were one and the same or real close to each other. I got several photos of the cliff dwelling inside and I'm in, in some of the photos. We, I want to get some better pictures of the horse head, the cliff dwelling, etc. And the fact that I'm there. We get these photos and, and we have these groups and we're searching. We find, as we're searching, we're finding other things, okay? The pit mine is here and then they said right across from the pit mine is in description is the cave where Waltz and Weiser hid. It's not right across. It's across the gulch and over where it's all brush covered. And we find over there this cave and it's two, more like 200 yards than 200 feet. So oh, it's over there and it's 15 feet wide so they could have easily have hid in there. Be no problem, and the brush was covering it up. And if they they saw somebody or heard somebody, they could easily go over there and hide. And we found tools for the people that had been there. I said in the 90s, 94, people working it. Well, we found them scattered in the brush all over the place. That shows that there were old picks, many of them, picks, shovels, a wheelbarrow, parts of a um, generator, what Jack Carlson always referred to that mine as the generator mine, and I always referred to it as the pit mine, and so we never crossed and connected the two that they were the same one till we hiked out there together. And I said, this is the pit mine in my mind. I didn't tell him about being there earlier, and we called it, he called it the generator mine. So while we were searching that area, above and below and all around, we expanded the search. We were able to find the cave, across from the mine, the mine dump down below and where the tunnel went off, what it shot off from the mine, that the tunnel was covered up, blasted over probably, and then the dump down below is much bigger, about three or four times bigger than the dump from the pit mine, which was 70 feet. And it was two to 300 feet was the tunnel. And so that's why the differences in the size. So, and going and doing the search of around the horse trail, we found a place up there where uh, perhaps a ton of rock had been taken out of the pit mine and set aside up there, or taken out of the mine that there was a prospect hole above the pit mine, which in the description that Jacob Waltz gave, that's the way it was. There was a digging above the mine, then there was the mine. And so all of this ore had been cobbed, and what was left was silver, a little bit of silver in the quartz and the, the, the barite that was there also. And so that was more clues. And in, in addition to that, we found two pillars. Two pillars are two columns which are written in the clues. That's one of the clues in getting to the mine, coming from the south to north. And one of the clues is you pass the board house go over the mountains, and you climb up, et cetera. So the board house was a clue. You could have gone one or two ways into Peralta. You could have gone through 
Whitlow and out, uh, the Whitlow, past the Whitlow Corral, Millside Canyon, and up through the gorge, also known as Hewitt Canyon. Hewitt Canyon is a gorge, Fish Creek is a gorge, and Peralta Canyon is a gorge. So there are three main gorges. And of course, Peralta leads to Weaver's Needle, which has no gold. And as we'll find out later in my talk, in the last episode, how many mines actually up there had gold. And in that area, we're gonna be, we'll talk more in at length about the um, prospectors that came there in 1906, the Woodberries. Bowser, myself, and Joe had been up there 20 times looking for the caches, the caches, caches. I call them stashes, it's easier to say. And we found where it was a small, on a, right off the horse trail, there was a small place that we moved the boulders and you could see where quartz had been in there, but alas, no gold. And it was big enough place, like about this, to stash some bags of gold dust or whatever, but they were gone. But the boulders were put back and you can see that very easily that this was a place created that this didn't happen naturally. And then, of course, finding the two columns. And Tom Collinborn wrote about it. And he even put a photo of the two columns and looked almost identical to what we found up there. So I was up there after finding all this stuff 20 some times to search for stashes. That's what we said, we had heard also of that pit mine that there were five openings and we found four. We found what could be four on that claim, but not the fifth. And is that another place where there's another ledge of gold? We don't know. That leads to perhaps uh, more mystery. That kind of leads us also, we thought we can't see everything and we can't find this fifth entrance. Maybe if we fly around over it, we'll find something. Flying around over it, I didn't find the other entrance, but I found another clue called the Trojan horse. And so from the air, in one of the stories, it says near this mine, there will be a rock formation that looks like a Trojan horse. And this stone formation, if you have any imagination at all, from the air, looks just like a Trojan horse could look like. And so that was one of the main clues. The question is, did he find the gold at the pit mine, I think he did, but it wasn't him that went in. And he wrote about it, that that could very well be the Lost Dutchman mine. In the next episode, I'm gonna be talking about Herman Patrash and Herman and Reine and Julia Search and what happened to the first searchers, their stories, of the Lost Dutchman Mine. Stay tuned for episode three, because we're not. We'll, Jack won't be reading stuff. He'll just be telling you the story. So come back. We'll see you then. Thank you. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. 